Hello, I'm Dr. Glenn Eisen. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And today it's my pleasure to be with Dr. Kenneth Binmuller, who is at Cal Pacific Medical Center. Today we'll be discussing his paper, Underwater Endoscopic Mucosal Resection of Sporadic Laterally Spreading Non-Ampullary Duodenal Adenomas. Welcome, Ken. It's nice to see you. Thank you, Glenn. I'm very interested in discussing this provocative pilot study. Um, can you give our uh, readers um, an, a, an explanation of what gave you the idea to do this? Well, let me tell you what inspired the underwater method to begin with. Um, I do a lot of endoscopic ultrasonography, and I made two observations. As you know, we need water in the lumen of the gut to get acoustic coupling. Sure. And I noticed one day that when the lumen is distended with water or filled with water, the muscularis propria on the outside stays round and it does not follow the involutions of the mucosa and the submucosa. Mm -hmm. And that the muscularis propria retains its native thickness. Now when we normally do endoscopy, we're filling the lumen with gas and that actually thins out the wall considerably. The second observation I made was endoscopically, a adenoma, for example, appears to float in water. And also there's contraction of the more superficial layers. So what may actually look like a very large lesion with gas distension, mm -hmm. with water filling, it actually contracts and becomes much smaller. So those were uh, two observations that inspired the underwater technique. Now regarding duodenal adenomas, they have been a challenge from the beginning. And as you know, the wall of the duodenum is very thin, probably the thinnest of any part in the GI tract. Distressingly so. Yes, and it's very vascular as well. And it's a more constrained lumen you're working in. So when you do submucosal injection, sometimes you actually make it very difficult to access the adenoma just because the lumen becomes more constrained. Right, I know from personal experience the anatomy gets quite distorted and uh, sometimes you're defeating the primary purpose. And submucosal injection sometimes even makes the capture of an adenoma more difficult, sometimes even impossible. And that's because when you inject water, you get increased tissue tension. And so you get also a elevation of the surrounding tissue. So all of the tissue becomes uh, elevated with increased tissue tension and your snare sometimes slips off as you close it. Okay. So there are a few things you mentioned in this paper which I think are important caveats for our readers if they're thinking of doing this or they're already resecting duodenal adenomas. And one is the issue with submucosal injection possibly tracking uh, cells into deeper layers. And then the, the, the second issue is that um, when you're doing submucosal injection, uh, you often lead to do much more piecemeal work because everything is completely distorted. Could you comment on those? Two yes, things? so the first point I actually really want to underscore because although we have no data to prove this, mm -hmm. we do know there's a very high recurrence rate after piecemeal resection of uh, wide area adenomas. And it is my hypothesis that what may account for that high recurrence rate is that when we stick a needle through an adenoma, and that's what we typically do. We don't inject around the adenoma, because if you do that, you just elevate the surrounding area and the adenoma actually uh, becomes more encaved or deeper. That we may actually seed adenoma cells into the deeper tissue layers. That could account for some of that increased uh, recurrence rate. It's uh, theoretical, of course, um, but my preference would be not to touch the adenoma, not to risk any seeding. Now, the second issue is about um, uh, just making the procedure of piecemeal resection easier. And when you do this underwater, now the adenoma f floats. It appears to float. It has a submucosal lift effect, although you haven't injected into the submucosa, but it looks as if you had done that. Mm -hmm. And you get also the contractility, as I mentioned, of the superficial layers, the mucosa and the submucosa. Now you can grasp a much larger surface area with sure. the same snare. Mm -hmm. Did you find, obviously you, you possibly could compare this to historical controls, that the time and duration of the procedure was less with this novel technique? Well, that will be the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to do uh, a comparative study, ideally randomized, of course. I, anecdotally, I can right. tell you yes, yes absolutely. I have been able to remove circumferentially uh, spreading tumors along the entire length of the second duodenum, something I would not ev have even ventured to try, I've been able to do that with this technique. 
So I do find that it shortens the procedure time. It's not just eliminating the step of the submucosal injection. It's really the, also the ability to capture a larger amount of tissue more easily. Okay. Another thing that you mentioned in the paper is you were uniformly doing EUS on all these patients, which possibly is a good thing. But you mentioned that um, you really can't look for a non-lifting sign because you're not injecting submucosally. Can you comment on that? That is a disadvantage, of course, that we can't rely on that non-lifting sign. That is often quoted in the literature. Uh, we chose to do EUS because we could not definitively exclude the possibility of some submucosal injection. In our study, we found uh, that none of the patients had invasive cancers. And I think with all of the advanced optics that we have today, we can reliably predict which lesions are likely to, likely to be carcinomatous and, uh, or invasive. So let's go to the results of the paper. Tell us what you found. So we included 12 patients in this study, in this prospective study, over a six-month period. And we were able to remove the entire adenoma in the index session in 10 of the 12 patients. In one patient who had a, lat a circumferentially spreading tumor, we did about half of the lesion in the first session and we completed the other half in the second session. Um, in the last patient, we completed half the circumference in the first uh, session, but the patient declined to come back for the second session and decided to go for surgery. Go for major yeah. surgery like a Whipple. That, okay. and yes, and had a serious complication from that, which uh, oh. I'll leave out for now. Okay. Let me, so again, of those 11 patients now, of the 12, uh, so the, if you, if you will, the technical success rate was 92%, but we have follow-up in all 11 patients. We brought the patients back at three to six months, and what we did is we, of course, evaluated the site with high definition, white light endoscopy and NBI, and we obtained at least six biopsies from the resection site. None of those patients had any residual adenomatous tissue. So I think that at least supports completeness sure. of resection. We, of course, need longer-term follow-up. Right. Those are very impressive preliminary results. Could you also comment on being careful about this and that there are risks to this procedure because there were a few complications? Yes, so although we believe this method decreases the risk of bleeding, if you look at the literature, the risk of bleeding is around 33% we had a 25% incidence of bleeding. Three of the patients had bleeding. Um, none of those required any form of, inter of intervention, though. We didn't have to go back and do any kind of endoscopic therapy. None of these patients uh, needed to go to surgery or anything. Uh, we think that there's a reduced risk of bleeding because the plane of resection is more superficial. When you use the saline assist method, you're really cutting at the juncture of the submucosa and the muscularis propria. And when you use this method, the plane of resection is actually in the upper third to the middle third of the submucosa. So you're above the large vessels. And that's why we coagulated the vessels, which we could see very nicely mm -hmm. afterwards, also underwater using a grasping forceps. But bleeding is nonetheless a significant risk for the duodenum. And that's because you have a very vascular network in the submucosa. So uh, I, I don't know that we can completely eliminate that. That's also been reported with um, sure. some mucosal dissection. And you were doing very aggressive resections, probably larger than most doctors would venture to do. 75% of our patients had adenomas that involved more than one-third of the circumference. And we had a few patients that had completely circumferential. One patient had an adenoma that extended along the entire second duodenum into the third. Can you comment on the sole patient who developed water intoxication? Yes. Well, that was interesting. So in this patient with a circumferentially spreading uh, lesion, this is actually the one that extended into the third duodenum. Mm -hmm. We had, it took about two and a half hours to accomplish this. It was very challenging. A lot of peristalsis. Um, and f we had infused more than five liters of water. Mm -hmm. We completed the procedure, everything went very nice. During the recovery, the patient had some altered mental status was just confused, that's all. Mm -hmm. We checked a sodium and it was very low. She had hyponatremia. How low? How low? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember now, it but low. it was, it was the, the anesthesiologist said, I think we're gonna have to admit this patient. Right. And I said, absolutely. Now, she responded beautifully to uh, hypertonic saline. Uh, immediately with complete reversal, her mentation was normal afterwards, no further complications. 
but I learned something about water intoxication <laughs> syndrome, something that I'd never encountered before right. since I'm not an athlete. Uh, that's something seen very commonly among athletes. When you drink an excessive amount of water, you can develop also water intoxication syndrome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bindel. It's thank been a you. pleasure.